Okay, darling, tonight is August 3rd, 2024. How are you today? I'm doing great, thanks. That's great. Well, do you know why? Do I know why? <laughs> well, you said you, you know how you're doing. Yes. Do you know why you're doing? I have a feeling I know why I'm doing. <laughs> well, let's have a look at today's show and find out what it's called, because that would be an interesting place to start. So why is it called Einstein broken up into three pieces like that? Ein with a capital S-T in the middle and then Ein. What the heck does that mean? And then the rest of the title says Secret Codes of God. Is that correct? That's correct. How come you didn't put the link inside the chat room for that? Let's go ahead and put that in there now. All right, so we're going to put the link to the blog that we're um, basing it to show on right now. Okay, so there you go, that's loading up now. All right, so the name of the show is Ein, S-T, Ein. So it's basically the spelling of the word Einstein, the name Einstein. So did you know that Ein is the same meaning as unique or one? No. So what you have here in the name Einstein is a triune, a triunal arrangement. So triune means three into one. Yeah, please go to the text area and read the format of the show. Thank you. So ein and ein is a unique on either side of ST when you break Einstein's name up this way. Ein, ST, ein. So ST is the second of a four pack in the alphabet called QRST. It refers to the mystery of the heart pulse and nature itself. It's formerly known phonetically as the word Christ, which was known as an essence power back before Christianity was formed. But here in this arrangement of the name Einstein, we see the second half of QRST. So we see a triunal arrangement. And uh, tell us who these three characters are. So they are... The triune, ein, and ein, and in the middle, st. So you have a triune of mother, father, and child in the middle. So the unique child or the unique persona or person is the one who's in the middle on stage. Right. So in essence, quote unquote, we're all on stage, or at least within our own uniqueness, we're all on stage in the world. Yeah. So Einstein is actually a, a way of trickily saying the triunal format of human beings just in the man's name. Because in German, in old German, E-I-N means unique or one. So the same way you are arranged, a unique mother, unique father, and a unique you. So you're on stage because you are born with essence, power, and no judgments. So when you're born, you don't have morals and you don't understand or recognize mortality. So during that period, while you don't recognize mortality or morals, you're just simply righteous. And you're fully connected to the center point. And you'll always be the center of the universe right. for the rest that's, of your life. That's the ST in the middle of I'm... S-T-I-N. It's also at the end of the word Christ, or the sounds of Christ. So at the end, you hear S-T, st. So in the alphabet, it's actually arranged Q-R-S-T. So it's like a quest that repeats, and you're on stage. So you actually only have four letters there. There's not a triune possible there. So what we did was put an asterisk, or a small I, in between QR and ST, and then it phonetically makes sense that it would be pronounced Christ. If you actually remove the vowel there in the center and have no vowel there, it would be pronounced cursed. So that's just the way it is. Even though cursed isn't spelled that way phonetically, it still sounds that way. So uh, yeah, please go to the text area and type any question. We'll pause if we see a question. Okay, so the reason, I'll just pause here. So the reason that we're saying mortality equals morality is because when you're born, 
and for a period of time afterwards you don't recognize death or mortality because mortality means a beginning and an end so when you're born you only know righteousness and your connection with the power that's powering your body and you're amazed by what you see around you as the universe so you're a righteous person you are not a moral person morals are taught to you after you learn about mortality so i believe that the reason these words are so close together is to make it even more challenging for us to recognize what the differences might be between morality morality and mortality so in the word mortality we actually have to say the sound of the letter t in greek which was pronounced tau the 19th letter and in our very own alphabet, if we simply give J the value of zero numerically, then our T in our alphabet is also the 19th letter. So the letter T has its own code of the triune that we're talking about tonight. So in the word Einstein, you have a triune, but in the symbol T, you have a triune. Because even though you have two lines, one that's vertical and one that's horizontal, the horizontal represents a seesaw so it can bounce back and forth back and forth we're seeing a static image most symbols are a static snapshot of something that's moving because everything in earth and the universe is moving even if it's dead it has an energetic signature of movement so in the symbol t or letter t we see this possibility of a still pole in the center like the seesaw at the playground and then a back and forth, left and right, or dualism, duality, motion of contention between either side of the seesaw. So how can there be two people inside each person? Well, that's because when you're born, you're downloading your mother's energy and lineage and your father's energy and lineage. So these assemble in the human body as basically alkaline and acid. And this also associates to your thinking. Now, whether you're born male or female, that's the memes you're going to be hit with from the world. So if you're born male, you're going to be told of certain things. If you're born female, you're going to be told of certain things. But everyone's unique inside themselves. And they're not so concerned with gender as they are with being unique. So, like, just to finish the mortal moral argument, you don't recognize mortality when you're born. So after you do, you adapt to the moral dictates of the world and the fact that you're going to die. And the innocent, neutral child that you were born as goes inside of you, and that becomes the second you also. So there's more than two ways to see duality. There's more than three ways to see duality. We can see duality in hundreds of ways. But there's only one way to see the triune. It's the same everywhere in the universe. It's masculine, feminine, and the neutral child. Okay. So the triune, when you go back to Pi, Indo-European roots, you have the word oi, O-I, and then the word no, oi, no. And that's where we get the word one and unique. So inside the word triune, we have it ending with un, U-N-E, and that is relating all the way back to Pi, Sanskrit, but in German, it's E-I-N. E-I-N, which is then we were saying is, if you look at the breakdown, there's three sections, E-I-N, S-T in the middle, and E-I-N at the end. Okay, let's go ahead and hit the, uh, hit the questions here, because I'm glad to see questions. So the morality, uh, let me just wait till my bars come back. Hold on, okay, there we are. Morality isn't non-existent because we all live under moral dictates of governments and police forces and groups that we belong in. So, you know, morality is not a non-thing. It absolutely exists. And we all make determinations as groups and as individuals what is good and bad. In other words, in our own timeline story, in our own body, that when we talk to ourselves, think by ourselves, we make determinations. When we hear things we make determinations. So we pretty much are the star of our own independent show, but how did we all get so solo like this? So the reason that we all got so solo like this is because we have a reason to do that. So the reason we're doing that is to explore the limit of limits through the exploration of light and dark. And we're literally exploring separations by using light and, and dark as a weapon or a tool 
to help us explore not only light and dark, but life and death, because light and dark transfers to life and death. So one of the triunes of our mortal existence is literally the mysterious beginning, the mysterious ending, and then a lifetime in between, or the range in between those two mysteries of the beginning and the end. So we really don't know about the beginning, and we really don't know about the end. The only thing we can know is the in-between part, the child's part. Each of us is walking literally as the child we were born as, but it's just hidden away inside ourselves now. So the inner child walks with us everywhere. It becomes our intuition. It saves our life sometimes, keeps us from walking in front of a speeding truck. You know, it's always gonna be there for us, but we have to decide if we wanna have mutual with it. Do we wanna be mutual with it or do we, do we wanna stay quote unquote blinded by the light? I mean, your inner child is safe in safekeeping in the dark near your heart. It's not in the light, you're in the light. And every night you talk to your inner child while you're unconscious in your sleep. So you're not missing out too much. Every 24 hours while you sleep, you have a conversation with your inner child. And a lot of things happen in the body while you're sleeping. So you believe that you're gonna wake up tomorrow and all of us do. We all have a form of death while we sleep and get resurrected in the morning. It's almost a Christ life death experience every 24 hours. It, it literally adds up to 1440 minutes. So morality is there for real in the lit world, but in the dark world where the inner child lives, not so much. Yeah, so good and bad is on the seesaw and the pivot point in the middle is us, the child. Can we get a fact check on this etymology? Now, actually, I have the, I'm the, um, the master of the etymology, so even though I could be challenged a million ways to Sunday, I personally did 25 years of research because I wanted answers to why I exist. So, yes, I do mix in number system, but the number system I use is one through nine. And the reason I keep counting all the numbers in the alphabet, but I give J a numerical value of zero is because J is inserted into our alphabet to mock the Christ essence that powers your heart. It's an indefinable power. It can't be given a definition, a name, or a number. We'll try the best we can, but I'm not going to give it a number in the alphabet. So the true number K by the numbers, excuse me, the true number 10 by the numbers is K. And K is a symbol of two things. The straight line is ice and the projection part to the right side is for fire. So these two pieces are linked somehow and viable. That's the third. So the K shows off the triune again, so. All right, so what words, Nate, do we have that form all or part of this word, one, or unique? So we're doing the Proto-Indo-European root meaning of one and unique. So we have alone. And then A-N. A-N. Anon. Anon. Angus. Atone. Any. Eleven. Inch. So, you know, it's funny that 11 gets a character formation in the identifying of un or ein or one or unique. And so, look at in 11, the word Eve is in the middle. Yeah, well, we have looked at this word as a triune, yes. So if you try, if you try to triune 11, you have Eve in the center figure, which is your nighttime visit with your inner child. And then you have N of contention at the end, and then the EL stands for the illuminated beings or uh, spiritual being turned to form. So our spiritual selves don't require light or senses. They have what you could think of as intuition. So our intuition or our power source, our dark side, is actually what we're powered from. It's an eternal source forever. The reason we're taught by the church to be afraid of our dark side is so that we never find our spiritual self without doing the work to earn it. Are you guys Gnostics? This would be considered spiritual mysticism or Gnostics. Uh, 
we don't really label ourselves. We're a, a lifetime full of experiences in uh, writing and research. But it would fit in that category better than what we see as Western Christianity, maybe? Well, my main uh, job since I was seven years old was to understand and explain why all adults in the world were under covert hypnosis. So that would happen to me in 1967. So I've been on that tear or that rage since 1967. So I did study all of world, I did study all of world history, all of the religions, all of spiritual mystics, and it led me into the spoken word. I, I actually can do that through a single word in the language that we use every day. So the word is cognition. And when you break down cognition to its base form etymologically, it means coming together to know, quote unquote, to know. So in the word Gnostic, you have knowing I see. So it means to know. So all of us have a form or connection to cognition. I have my own determinations on how to explain what cognition is to individuals and to us as a group. But uh, we could talk about that sometime. But in the word cognition, you actually see an implication of the word Gnostic because it has the meaning of coming together to know. So all of us are coming together to know. Whether we admit it or not, I mean, we can see obviously that we all come together to know. Would you like to know what the mystery of the number 13 is, or at least one of them, because there's a bunch. But I, which I'll, I'll tell you the most important one if you'd like. So if you take the 13, the number 13 on a page, and imagine you can move these, either of these figures, like they're uh, stick figures like a kid plays with. Uh, if you push them together, the straight line and the three, you make the letter B. So number two, or the B, the being, is hiding inside the number 13. This means that the letter B is hiding or cloaking the number 13. So 13, as you know, has a history as the 13th one at the table. Obviously, it has that history. And it also is like the devil has it for Halloween and satanic stuff. So the devil has it too. And Jesus, the character, has been accused of representing good and bad. And then you also have a triune being claimed because you have a single unit made of three parts. So all of us are really walking, I believe, as the Christ child, not in the name, not in the name Christ, in the essence power of Christ. So we all carry this triune, you see, of the 13. So we're all part mother, part father, and part ourselves, neutral. And as we were saying earlier before you came in, the neutral child escapes to your heart and hides in the dark while you're alive once you learn that you're gonna die and that you have to adhere to the moral dictates of the world. All right, any other questions, KC? Could you just type them in the chat room to interrupt all these jerks that are saying mean things about me in there? Thanks. Talk. Yeah, I can stick to the chat room if you want. No, no, no. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll invite. Yeah, we're only going to go on for because we've already been on for an hour. So we're going to probably cut out in about 10 minutes. So we're just going to read off a little bit and then I'll take a couple more questions. Yeah, thanks for coming in. So yeah, in Old Irish, uh, it was O-I-N, which is very close to the Pi um, setup for one or unique. So in the Pi Proto-Indo-European, you have O-I and then N-O, so O-I-N-O. And then that becomes later the meaning of, their meaning then meant one, unique. And that became our word, one, unique. And it's also seen in our language when we end the word with U-N or U-N-E. Or that even happens in the word an because we were just actually discussing all the different words that have um, all or part of this one or unique inside the word. So we were up to 11. We were discussing 11. So uh, as I was discussing earlier, the J, we give a numerical value of zero. So our 11 is the L because K is 10, then L. So L is actually in the word 11. It's saying L even. 
So if you think of El as sprouting up from the land, because that's kind of what the Elohim story is about, is about the material, you know, the spiritual being coming up into material form into a lit world. So if you think about the 11, the word 11, it's the letter L, which represents in Latin the word normal or a perpendicular line. So it's literally a sprout. So the L is like a sprout. But in the ancient Hebrew text, you see El as short for Elohim or the lit, illuminated being. Illuminated would mean material in my eyes. So I see illuminated as a sensual being. You only need senses if there's light. So in our spiritual version of ourselves, we're in the dark. So that's why we get to visit that every night when we sleep. We get to revisit our dark self. And the reason that churches and um, universities have been calling dark uh, evil concealed, obscure, all kinds of dirty words for the last 1,000 years is because they must have some motive for you not to know what's so good about the dark. It's pressure on us. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so they're proving to us we're either in a game or they're playing a game. But either way, we all ended up being playing the games. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. So this word unique in one comes up all over the place. It comes up in lone, like the lone ranger and lonely, and even the word known, none. Non, N-O-N, and none, the way we spell in English. So uh, then we have null, null and void, null. Again, we have one, once. And then the word ounce, for a single ounce, we have it again. So it keeps coming up. And then the word that we started with, triune. So triune is the most serious number to our power. It's triune isn't a number, but it means three in one. So each of us is one unit, one container, one being, one unique, each one of us. But we're made of three things. There's one and three again. Right, so the Holy Trinity is unholy because it's putting pressure on us. And it's a jester. But if you look at the word jester, just to help a motherfucker out, the word jester broken down says justar. Yeah. I am the star. Right on. So jester is another easy, tricky word to unwrap. But back to the triune, you have three into one. So all of us is a single entity, and we're walking as a three-parter. We have our mother part, our father part, and our unique neutral child self. So we'll leave it at that and answer any questions, if there are any. Then we're going to break the show. Okay, looks like no more questions, so everybody have a great... Hi, guys. Uh, hey, how are you doing, man? Hey, go ahead. Go ahead. Feel free to ask a question. So, your guys' main discussion is around etymolo like, uh, etymology of words, and sort of like where they come from? Mm, actually, my long lifetime study of like 57 years eventually led me into linguistics, neurolinguistics, philology, etymology, grammarianism, and basically the way that the sequences of sounds and ideas are used by the elites. In other words, the owner of the message is able to manipulate the minds of the populace. So I started to recognize this when I was a little child. And then I eventually, through years of all different studies of world history and all different things, mysticism, everything, you name it, religions. But uh, it eventually led me that all the knowledge is in the spoken word and the arrangements in the language. And that language itself is living and aggregating the same way each unique person is. Yeah. Uh, not to throw too many monkey wrenches into it, but uh, I have heard uh, someone say, in, uh, I've heard someone say that. Uh, you know, the word is the, uh, the end all be all kind of, you know, I mean, it's, that is kind of the, yeah, it's the, the beginning and the end. Yeah, it is the, it is, it is between the beginning and the end. So when we're born, we can't remember when we were born. We can only start remembering at a certain age and we don't remember dying or after we die. So we really only have our voice and our ears for the time that we're alive. Yeah, but thinking in the word, like, uh, you know, like uh, being able to, like, read and write and that kind of thing, that's, uh, it's quite different than, 
the rest of the continent. Well, I, yeah, I, I think that we bring it forward into the words that we speak. So the, the sounds are not given to power in our teaching in our universities. I mean, yeah, you might hear about it if you go into certain studies, but generally the power of the sequences of sounds and how important each sound is emotionally and how these sounds get associated to ideas and reactions and, and uh, automatic you know, uh, triggers. So we can control these things if we were taught about the immense power that sounds and sequences have, but that would take away the immense power that the elites have over the population. Yeah. You mind if I ask you a question that's it's on topic, but slightly off, like um, just a, your opinion. Uh, yeah. Do you think that like uh, animals, you know, like besides humans, do you think like animals to some degree are like conscious? They absolutely. Kind of oh yeah, they're hundred percent have consciousness. They have feelings. They have social behavior. Uh, the orca that lives out in the ocean, the big giant dolphin, the orca, it, it keeps yeah. family. It keeps family close to it for thirty years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they're very communal. Yeah, even it's wild. And, and turkeys in the wild are um, extremely social and communal. Um, and, commu and communicative also. I, I live in a bird area where I live in Southeast Oregon, so birds fly through here all the time for migration. So I'm always looking at the birds and watching them talk to each other and uh, all the different dramas that they go through. So, and, and adages and isms that uh, the term free willy and uh, even Steven. So yeah, yeah, the reason that even Steven always shows up after Willy Nilly shows up is because these two are linked to the idea of cause and effect. So the adage of free Willy, I mean, Willy Nilly, and I said free Willy. I said free Willy, I meant Willy Nilly. So the idea of Willy Nilly and even Steven always being tied together is because they always are tied together because they represent cause and effect. Well, are you referring to this? I thought you were referring to the movie Free Willy. No, I was, but I'm saying the reason I got into studying the orcas, it's strange the way I got into orcas. It wasn't just because they're cool animals. It was because I was interested in, in the idea of willy-nilly. Whenever, whenever you get in trouble doing something willy-nilly, something even Steven comes along to straighten you out. Everybody knows this. I can't, I, for as far as I know, it's been around since the 1800s or older. So it's been around for a long time. And it was the way that parents and adults taught the children. So it's like an old childhood fable to explain to the little kids, yeah, like, it's cause and effect. Don't get all willy nilly. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's a great, but it's a great rule for a child coming into adulthood so they know how to handle himself that he's always going to see an effect to whatever causes he's responsible for. It gives you a lot more humility and respect. I would probably have to go back a little bit further in our evolution to get to the bottom of that. But like, yeah, as far as being in a closed in area and being hunted, yeah, the world's like that right now. I mean, it's literally like that right now. So and it's funny because the ancient, in the ancient times, not that far ancient, it's just a couple hundred years, the word tract means t and part of contract. The word tract means a place to hold large animals to be hunted. So even in the word contract, we have this funny explanation of, of the word contract because con means coming together to know or coming together to go out. Cognition means coming together to know. Con, just the word root, con, means coming together to go out. So contract means coming together to go out into a contained area to be hunted as large animals. That's what the word contract means in the ancient meaning. But as far as going back in time further uh, to your question about Garden of Eden and why, why this experience? Well, I'm going to go two places. So first I'm going to go to the ancient story of Mott, and then I'm going to go to the ancient story of God. So the ancient story of Mott is uh, told by different legends, and it's that the human race goes through three stages. First, of unified all of us under one-mindedness, even though we're personified. And then second, so we would be more in a spiritual dark form, wouldn't need senses, wouldn't have heads, but we would be alive, unique, so to speak, the way we are now, but not 
single-minded or unique-minded. So stage two in the three stages of Mott is the era of separations. So separations, we go into a unique-minded state, but this does include murder. So it also includes light and sensuality. So this period is instantly aggregating to the first period. The completion, the, com the completion would be uh, the aggregation of the two experiences. The experiences of being personified in the dark without senses of spiritual beings, but unified minded, mixed and aggregated with the experience of being in the light with definitions but that would include separating from each other and having unique minds, and that would also include killing and murder. So that's why we see ourselves in various contracts is because we're having that experience at this time. So that's step one is the story of Mott, and we go back even further to the secret story of God. Then you see an entity that cannot be seen by us because it's way beyond our capacity to understand it from our perspective at this moment. So God would represent a single still point or a pivot point like we see in the compass, the clock, or uh, in the turntable on the record player. You have the still point in the center. This is seen in the ancient Asian uh, philosophy of the I Ching. So. He asked a, well, he asked a question about um, the Garden of Eden. So we're just basically talking about that. Ah, uh, right. Okay. <laughs> That's my boy from Philly. So I just have to remember all the cows I killed because I sat in that cheesesteak line hundreds of times, man. And like, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't. I stopped eating cows back in um, 2010. I've been a vegan for like 14 years. But um, where did? No, I'm not from Philly no more. I live in a desert now. Yeah, I know. Oh yeah, so all right, so listen, listen high up. Let me finish the explanation because I was only like a minute out from being done. So, uh, so, so when you go all the way back to the beginning, you have this God force figure, but it's so intense and immense that we can't understand it. It's like too big to see. So it, to us in perspective, it looks like a tiny still point, as I was saying, like the record player. So we get to have this analysis or this viewpoint in our lit up sensual world. We get to see clocks and compasses and record players and seesaws at the playground. So even in our symbols, we get to recreate this too. As I was saying earlier in the capital letter T, you see two lines, one's horizontal, one's vertical, but you can also imagine that that vertical line is still, it's not moving. So back to the Garden of Eden to finish the story up for you. The God particle force character would actually be the snake in the Garden of Eden, and it also represents the neutral child, or the child you were right before you got born, and the child you were right after you got born, up until the point that you accepted death as a legitimate thing, that you were mortal, and that you would be a hearing for the rest of your life to moral dictates by more powerful people than you. So once this happens, your life changes, and then that snake, child, God force particle of you goes inside of you into the dark and it stays there as your source of intuition and also it partners up with your heartbeat or the god force so your inner child that you lose when you become immortal stays with you for the rest of your mortal life next to your heartbeat So we're all walking around with this still point inside of us, and it's up to us to decide whether we want to turn toward it and ask it, would it allow for us to communicate with it? So the interface to this God particle thing is you, you as, a, as the child you were, right before you were born, when you were a water being, when you were clear, and then right after you were born, when you started breathing air, and then from that point until you learned you were going to die. So that is you. That's the interface. It's inside you. It's very still and very quiet, but it represents your intuition. And if you seek to communicate with your inner self, your inner child, it will communicate with you. Dude, I talked to a 70-something-year-old today that was as spry as you could imagine. And, uh, like, the stories he told me in just a 10-minute conversation would just kill you, man. I mean, seriously. 
this guy had the most amazing life and he spent exactly 20 years in the military so he could get his pension but uh he's in 164 countries he fought in like 20 wars six of them he was allowed to shoot back 14 of them he wasn't allowed to shoot back how about that huh when he was 12 years old in los angeles three raiders came in his house and were trying to kill his whole family 12 years old and he he ran to the room where the rifle was and loaded it with some shotgun shells and he blew them away at 12 years old and saved his mother from being raped and killed i mean this guy's an atheist he doesn't believe in god he doesn't believe there's any god it's not that easy to find this inner self can you imagine all the traumas this guy's put himself through and he's trying to rationalize it now at age 70 something you know, I chased him off that yard sale that we were at because of the way I was talking to him. And I didn't disrespect him at all, believe me. I wouldn't do that around here because everybody's a redneck. But, uh, yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> I spent some time in Boston, actually. Yeah, you know, it, it sounds like Yahoo. Hey, hey, did you know Did you know one of the ancient stories? Remember, I took, were you listening when we talked about the uh, three stages of Mott earlier? All right, well, the three stages of Mott was supposedly issued to humanity by this character named Y-A-K-U-B. To me, it's pronounced Yakub. But if you look at the phonetics there of Yakub, I'm basically saying ye, meaning you, and then cube. So, like, basically, I've just put you in a box. So, when Yakub, I know it's so funny that these words come forward like that, right? So Yakub gives the people the, the story of the three stages of Mott, that they're leaving Garden of Eden. And the, no, actually what I'm doing is recognizing that language and, and the spoken word is alive, the same way any individual person is an aggregation of their entire life. The language and spoken words that we share are also living and alive and aggregating as we go. Yeah, and what do I you think of like the best way forward with a changing language where people are not coming together agreeing about how the language is being spoken? Well, actually, we have a different problem than that. Our problem is that we don't recognize that we're the ones that hold all the cards. So all of us have basically become, there's a famous song, there's a famous song called uh, Blinded by the Light by Manfred Mann and the Seven Sisters or something like that. But uh, Manfred Mann sung Blinded by the Light. So what's basically happened is our seesaw of reality, which is basically back and forth between our intuitional self, which is in the dark, and our defining calculating self, which is in the light. So we ride the seesaw back and forth and we even go to sleep every night to try to catch up. But the point is, we've become such a lit world, and we focus on things lit so much that even on a chemical basis, our melatonin and serotonin leads us into light, and we don't get a chance to experience the dark. So this is why people are becoming more leaning into not seeing their value, because they're, believe it or not, they're not spending enough time in the dark or in the peace. So another way of looking at dark is literally being quiet. Like when you're being more quiet and facing someone right in their face and doing your best to keep your mind clear and your lips closed, you'll actually learn a lot more from listening that way than you would ever learn from talking. So we're actually holding the, the cards, each other. We, all, we are holding the cards, the regular people. But unless we take the time to listen to each other and face each other in the face, then we won't be able to see that because we're, our, our brain is like ping-ponging. There's all these different ideas going back and forth. Yeah, you can attribute some of that to the hyper-rationalized world that we've developed and the devices that we carry and things like that. But it's still an individual choice for each person whether they're going to limit their time every day to an hour on the phone or not or you know whatever choices you make, right? But if you're spending too much time on the screen or in the lights and thinking about conflicts, then that focus is going to prove to you your power by making those things appear in front of you. So if you're always in the light, 
then when you go to sleep, you'll still be in the light chemically. And even in your thinking while you're going to sleep, you're still in the light. You're not getting that time in the dark. So there's two ways to get dark. One is to make sure you prepare to sleep and get a good night's sleep and don't think about hard things. And the other way is spend your daytimes in the light doing acts of kindness when you have the urge to speak something that would be mean or rude as often as you can check yourself from doing it because you can't be perfect overnight but once you start leaning into it then you can progress every day a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more and eventually you'll find yourself face to face with people instead of on screens the question is how do you avoid a tribunal because the last thing you want is to be in a tribunal because that would be the tribe taking care of business on your ass. So in the matter of lingnostics, we're breaking down linguistics. How do we decode a tribunal so we can stay out of a tribunal? Well, we look at the word carefully and see that the word triunal is inside the word tribunal. So triunal is T-R-I U-N-E for triune. Unbelievable. And then after triune, if you make it the word triunal, then it's T-R-I-U-N-A-L or T-R-I for either the sound of try or attempting or leaning into an idea. And then un. UN meaning one and also all the meanings of U and N together. And then AL, which always means all. So triunal is T R I for tri or three, un or one. So there's your tri un, three pieces into one unit, and then all. So when we acknowledge our triunal format, we see that we're three into one where our mother our father and our neutral inner self all three plus the reason which is the all triunal so when we recognize our triunal it fills us with respect and humility and then we will never be facing a tribunal because we will never be hurting anyone the tribunal has a similar meaning when you break the sections of the word down. You still have try for lean into an idea or three, and you still have un all at the end. But in the very center, you have the letter B and the sound of B, tribunal. So the B is the second letter and the number of a being. So anytime you see a B in action, it is a B ing. So in the word tribunal, we have a single B ing being singled out by the group because they failed to acknowledge that they were triunal. Mm -hmm.